It's Small Business Week in Colorado Springs, Olympic City, USA. Hi everyone, I'm Mayor John Southers. This is an exciting time to live, work, and play in our city, and that wouldn't be the case without our incredible small business community. To our small business leaders, I hope you enjoy a full week of valuable presentations and events. Thank you for doing business in Colorado Springs. This tiny payment thing is a giant pain. Hi, ladies. Alex from US Bank. Can she help? How about a comprehensive point of sale system that can track inventory, manage schedules, and customize orders? That's what US Bank Business Essentials is for. What about a new oven? Can US Bank help us there? We can serve loans in as fast as 12 minutes. That would be a big help. Huge. Jumbo. Ginormous. Woo! Woo! Finding ways to make your business boom. That's what US Bank is for. We'll get there together. Starting small is a good thing here in Colorado Springs. Take us for example. We are the small but mighty economic development team at the city of Colorado Springs. But thanks to our long list of partners, we're able to offer great resources to help our small business community. The COS Open for Biz website is a step-by-step -step roadmap for those just getting started. For anyone struggling throughout the process, we offer issue resolution and support. Our office can connect you with local, state, and federal resources. We know that a small group can accomplish big things. At the City of Carter Springs, we love all business, but small business is the backbone of our economy and makes us a more vibrant and interesting community. Visit coloradosprings.gov slash smallbiz so we can help you find business success. Thank you for choosing Colorado Springs, Olympic City, USA. Welcome everyone as we celebrate Small Business Week in the Pikes Peak region. Our Small Business Week continues to be the largest celebration of small businesses throughout Colorado and one of the largest in the United States. As a small business owner, I know how important small business is to El Paso County. Small businesses, both urban and rural, are the backbone of our local economy. As we commemorate Small Business Week with local events and workshops and the awards celebration, we recognize all our entrepreneurs and small business owners in El Paso and Teller County. My thanks go out to the Pikes Peak Small Business Development Center and the Better Business Bureau for their hard work celebrating and empowering small businesses. I encourage everyone to support small businesses by choosing to eat and shop at their favorite local and independently owned venue, not just during Small Business Week, but all year long. Thank you so much for supporting our small businesses. I've lived in Colorado Springs all my life. I was adopted by folks here in 1951 when I was three weeks old. For most of my early years, the City Auditorium was the largest indoor space in Colorado Springs. And so it housed most of the major indoor entertainment events. I came to watch the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus in this auditorium. I remember vividly as a young child watching the elephants run around on the floor. I came to numerous Harlem Globetrotter games. So I've got tremendous memories of how important this building was to Colorado Springs as a community when I was growing up. 
on the forefront of the City Auditorium's 100th anniversary. In the same way the citizens of 1923 came together, we invite our entire community to come alongside the vision for repurposing this building. A vision to reignite this building to its original mission. A place for the use of the citizens and the glory of the city in a fresh, vital, and relevant way. The City Auditorium, with the leadership of the Community Cultural Collective, will be that place in the center of our city, in the heart of our downtown. A place of coming together, bringing ideas, partnerships, opportunities, collaborations, and outreach. A place that will tell our story, tell the story of all that Colorado Springs has to offer, to each other, to the state, to the nation, and to the world. The Colorado Springs Chamber and Economic Development Corporation is the largest business organization in the Pikes Peak region. We are built and infused by our small, mid-size, and large member businesses. Chamber and EDC members gain access to new partnerships, influence, and increased brand awareness among customers and peers. No other entity in our region can influence and leverage the power of the business community like we do. Let's achieve your goals. I decided that it was the best option for me to say, hey, I'm struggling, I need help. In speaking with Jonte, I knew the pain he had, but I also saw in him a determination. It was his determination that got him where he is. Dr. Moss, he says that he sees himself in me, and him giving up on me is like him giving up on himself. When he talked about some of the experiences he had, it wasn't that I was doing it from a textbook, it was from personal experience. I knew that same pain, I knew that same frustration, that same hurt. My experience with Kaiser Permanente is different from other healthcare providers, is simply behind the care. In Kaiser Permanente, we're different in the fact that we treat the whole person. Dr. Moss helped me cope with a lot of things. I am present, I am more active, my overall life experience has dramatically changed for the better. Good afternoon! <laughs> Welcome everyone to the last day of Small Business Week. Sad face, right? Sad face. It's been an amazing week that we've had here in the Pikes Peak region, Pikes Peak SVDC and the Better Business Bureau. Everyone, my name is Aikta Markulier. I'm the Region 8 Administrator for the U.S. Small Business Administration. Thank you very much. New role, everybody. New role. Um, and former director of the amazing Pikes Peak Small Business Development Center. What the Pikes Peak SVDC does for our community is offer education, training, resources, and you know, events like this to really support and foster the small business community here in the Pikes Peak region. Paul? Well, I wanna say thank you for attending Small Business Week all week. The bash was a huge success for the first year of doing it. We had hundreds of people showing up celebrating our local small businesses. And so thank you for attending that and the workshops this week. You can find them all on pikespeaksbdc.org forward slash small business week. Yeah. And I wanna just tell you a little bit about uh, our history. We've been around oh, yeah. for 10 years yep. that we have worked together, the Better yep. Business Bureau and the SBDC. And in 2020, when everyone shut down uh, during the pandemic, we decided to go online and make this thing virtual. So okay. the SBA let us know that we were the largest small business week in the United States with 11,700 views from around the world. And uh, last year, we maintained that by how many years in a row have we been the largest in Colorado? About three years now. So three years running, yeah. the largest in Colorado, and that's because of you. Yeah and this community and our small businesses. A funny story, I was on an SBA call the other day, my new life, right? Lots of calls, lots of meetings. And there's this guy from Florida that's like, I think we run the largest small business week. And I was like, oh yeah, how many? Are I was off camera, like, you know, multitasking, you know how we do that. And he goes, we have about 300 people. I'm like, <laughs> that's not enough. And then there's another guy that was in Georgia that's like, we have 600. And I was like, <laughs> I get on camera, I'm like, so we had 11,000 last year? <laughs> and they're like, 
you guys win. And I'm like, you know what? That's why we're number one for small business here in the Pikes Peak region, because we win, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. we couldn't do this without our sponsors, and uh, let's go through who they are. Yes. And this year, we have U.S. Bank returning as presenting sponsor. Wirenut sponsored the bash. Mm -hmm. Colorado Housing and Finance Authority, also known as Chaffa, they came in t uh, this year as our keynote sponsor. Jerry O'Brien will be here a little bit later. We'll tell you a little bit about him. Colorado Springs Chamber and EDC. I see Jana here. Thank you, Jana, for being here. City of Colorado Springs, El Paso County Economic Development. I see the director of El Paso County Development, Crystal, here in the audience. Kaiser Permanente Creative Consortium. I mean, look at these signs, you guys. Like. They do an amazing, amazing job. Colorado Enterprise Fund, Eva, I see you out here. Thank you for being here. Mount Carmel Veterans Service Center, Ent Business Banking, Air Academy Federal Credit Union, Bryan Construction, and PNC Bank. And a workshop sponsor of Robert Half. We have had insane promotion this year. Yeah. And that was by the Colorado Springs Business Journal. They have a table in back. We have the Colorado Springs Independent. We have 92.9 Peak FM, KVOR, KKTV, 11 News, Hugspeak Media, and beverages this week have been provided by Squire Coca-Cola. Very good. All right, next up, we're gonna get right into this because we have a packed show for you. Um, I'm gonna overwhelm you with numbers later. Yes, don't be too excited, but we have good speakers on either side of that. All right, so coming up next, Jim Harris, I'd like to introduce you. Jim Harris has been a huge supporter of Small Business Week. You know, even past the 10 years, it's been a week. Wow. U.S. Bank has been a partner of ours for I think like 19 years on this program. It's been a very long, long sponsorship so long partnership. We can't, remember exactly. we can't really quite remember how long we've been around, right? Yeah. But thank you for being here and please say a few words. Absolutely. Yep. Well, uh, welcome everyone. What a great week it's been. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Paul, probably gets the flexibility award with so many people having to be out and pivoting and so forth. So great job. Uh, also, uh, Ekta, isn't that great that uh, the new head of the Wet Mountain States region for Rocky Mountain region is from Colorado Springs? Isn't that too great, right? And, uh, and then Jonathan and the BBB and the award that they received recently. So lots to celebrate this week, lots to celebrate. One of the things I want to say is how impressed, you know, we have, we've all kind of gone through this COVID thing over the last couple of years. But Sometimes when you look back and you really see how things came together, it was the BBB and the SBDC and their partnership that really helped the whole community pivot. And I'll tell you why, because if you remember, it was like March of 2020, and we were getting ready for Small Business Week. Let me move that up. We were getting ready for Small Business Week, and I remember Jonathan Aikta and Paul came, and they said, well, what do you think? Does the bank still want to do this and so forth? And I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And they said, you know what? We're gonna put those resources in having the absolute best online event we can possibly have. And as Aikta shared, it was the biggest small business event in the entire country, not just Colorado, the entire country. And what they also did is there were a lot of nonprofits in town saying, you know, I think we're gonna cancel our events. We're gonna, we're gonna cancel all these events because we just don't know how to do it. So I, I said, you know, you need to reach out to Aikva because she knows how to put a show on virtually. And so it set the right example for everybody in the community, and she was more than willing to share, you know, the information that they learned during the process. So I sure appreciate that. And, and again, congratulations to all the winners this week. That was great. Uh, I also couldn't be at the Business Bash on Saturday, so again, we all have to pivot, right? So Natasha Hudson, who's right there in front of me, uh, she said, sure, I'll take the mic. I'll get up on stage. I don't think we got her to dance though, but maybe the next time. So anyway, well, again, congratulations. Thanks for being here. Thanks for allowing US Bank to be a part of this great celebration. Thank you. Before we go on to our next quick speaker, I just want to say thank you to our other chamber leads that are here today. Lola, I see you from the Women's Chamber. Thank you for always supporting. Terry Hayes from the Tri Lakes Chamber. Thank you for being here. Rodney Gallette, thank you for being here from the Black Chamber. We appreciate your support. Okay, next up. All right, we have Eva Padilla with CEF here to say a few words. Before she gets here, I see a lot of you not eating food. The food is delicious. Grab a box. It's uh, we're paying for it for you. 
Thank you, Jim. And so enjoy it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. The Colorado Enterprise Fund is happy to sponsor today's State of Business event. So thank you very much for having us here. There is no doubt that 2020 was a year like no other, and safe to say that our businesses were heavily impacted by COVID. As a nonprofit CDFI for the past 45 years, it is embedded in us to help with the prosperity of our communities by providing access to capital and various business resources. During the pandemic crisis, we were able to deploy 52 million in grants and loans, which was made possible through our team's efforts and various partners. We were also able to bring additional funding to help create some of the most innovative loan programs in the marketplace, especially for our underserved communities. We understand the challenges that our startup and minority-owned businesses face, which is why 62% of our impact has been with these entrepreneurs. In CEF, we are fully committed to our Colorado businesses and know that their strength and resiliency is what makes our state great. We hope to grow in our capacity to better serve our communities, and we appreciate your trust in us as we help advance small businesses in Colorado. I want to thank everyone for having us here, and thank you for showing up. Next up, we have Samantha Sargent with One Million Cups. So I believe that there is iced coffee, hot coffee, decaf coffee in the back, and that's a million cups. She's gonna tell you a little bit about the organization. We have to dance as you come up. So, <laughs> um, thank you for having us. Actually, every year, One Million Cups combines with Small Business Week. One Million Cups is a entrepreneur support group. We meet every Wednesday at 9 a.m. This group of people here with me are some of our organizers, some of the sponsors. So if you're involved in One Million Cups, if you've been to One Million Cups or you know what it is, raise your hand. Yes, beautiful. So we'd love to have you come join us each week. And so again, it's the Entrepreneur Support Week. Net networking does happen as a beginning and end part, but if you are a speaker, you are in your first one to five years of business or during a major pivot. So if you are an entrepreneur, this is definitely your people. And what they're sharing is their entrepreneurial journey. So the pitches are not trying to sell you. They're sharing with you who they are, what they do, and why they do it. And then we do 20 minutes of Q&A where we get to learn about their business. We can learn about their struggles. And then as an entrepreneur community, we give them feedback about what we learned during their time, and then we continue to give that feedback as they continue to come to One Million Cups. Some people come every week, some people come once yeah, a month or seasonally, we don't have any rules. Okay. Okay. So if you go to onemillioncups.com, you'll see how that goes along. And then again, our so we are at the Next Us. So this is Judy Pairing. she owns the Next Us. She's sponsoring our space this year. So you can talk to her about where that is. And then today's coffee is the Sleepy Turtle Coffee Company. And that's what you're drinking, and that's what you'll drink each week at One Million Cups. And the people that pay for that coffee are our coffee sponsors. So this month, it happens to be the Alzheimer's Association. Um, so we have some cards on the table for that. And then the SBDC and the BBB provide our cups. So yeah, um, it's great to be a part of such a group. And we range, we average about 40 people per week. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were at 107 on average, so we're definitely looking to help the entrepreneurs however they're looking to plug in. Um, one media sponsor that's, we, we record all of our sessions and we live stream them to Facebook. So Fetty Studios is the one that doing all that work. Kevin's not here today, but um, you'll get to meet him if you come to a One Million Cups presentation as well. We've won some awards from local places, so you can check those out. We have a table at the back over there. Thank you guys for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Well, we have gotten to that part of the program where I get to reintroduce our co-host here, Aitha Markulier, and she is going to tell you the state of small business facts, figures. There's a lot. I don't think she's going to cover it all in depth, but it will be available online or you can reach out to us and we can email it to you as well. If you want to uh, get more about those stats, you're welcome to take pictures as well, correct? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Paul. Hi again. You guys must be eating, you're super quiet. <laughs> good, is it good? All right, awesome. All right, so as Paul said, it, well, 
Paul reintroduced me, but what's strange is today I'm kind of in a couple of roles, right? I'm here for the U.S. Small Business Administration. Um, by the way, first speech ever, so I get to test it out on you guys. Lucky you. <laughs> got the presentation two days ago, we'll see how I do. And then um, also it is my honor and privilege to be representing the Pikes Peak Small Business Development Center today and the amazing team there, Becky, Shala, Mackenzie, and Lauren, and the many consultants that I see here in the room. So my pleasure, this is my last hurrah as their representative. And so I will do you guys justice, I promise you. So what I will be talking about here today is we're gonna start off as we normally do at the State of Small Business, which is usually a standalone event, but why not put it into Small Business Week? Makes a lot of sense, right guys? So um, we're gonna start at the federal state levels and then go down to our local levels with the report to the community from the Pikes Peak SBDC and then the BBB as well. Sound good? All right. I love it, Rodney, when you yell back at me and heckle me because it makes me show that people are engaged. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, cheer for the numbers, right? Cheer for the impact that you'll see here in a minute. Thank you. All right, so I don't know where I'm pointing this. There we go. Okay, so even when I presented just for the SBDC, I always thought it was important to really talk about the importance of uh, small business in Colorado, right? So in Colorado, small businesses represent 99.5% of all small business. So that's all of you guys and all the members and clients that you guys take care of, 99.5%. And you can actually grab these numbers from the Colorado SBA profile. You can pull those up at any time if you just Google it. But 99.5%, I mean, that's, that's huge, right? And then in addition, I wanted to point out a couple other numbers as well. You know, nationally, uh, nationally 43.1% of all small businesses are women owned. But here in Colorado, 44.5% which makes me very happy. But as we all know, the trends for small business growth, especially during the pandemic, were for women-owned businesses, with even the Hispanic community being the fastest growing within that. Thought you'd like that, Eva. Yep. And so it's really important that we understand that strategy for our community and our small businesses and our organizations really need to focus on what the trends are, and that is one of the main trends. Uh, nationally, 6.6% are veteran-owned businesses. It shouldn't surprise us that we have a higher number here in Colorado at 7.4%. Thank you all for your service if you have served and are now running businesses as well. And as you can see here, there's some other stats, but I only have 15 minutes for all of this, so I'm gonna be flying through. The one thing I do wanna tell you is that these, uh, these slides will be on the Small Business Week website uh, by tomorrow. Uh, we'll be posting them so you can download them at any time, okay? All right, so the U.S. Small Business Administration, I'm gonna do the spiel, guys. So we work to ignite change and spark action so small businesses can confidently, confidently, not, oh, I think I know what I'm doing, right? We don't want that, but confidently start, grow, expand, and recover. And how the Small Business Administration does that is how? Guess what, through the resource partners. We do a lot of talking, that's what you're gonna see me do for the next few years. We do a lot of pushing of programs, but really the people, that do the work are the SBDCs, the SCORES, the Women's Business Resource Centers, the MACASAs, and the other entrepreneurial programs that they put into effect. So the most important thing is that those organizations have the ability to produce programs that are equitable and accessible to all people, whether it's urban, rural, ethnic minorities, whatever it is, it needs to be accessible by all. So it's really important that, that we maintain that. And that's what the US Small Business Administration makes sure that we do. So we do that because of the people on the ground, and I can't give enough props to the Pikes Peak SBDC and the consultants that have made this Pikes Peak SBDC the top 10 in the nation. I have a lot of passion, can you tell? A lot of passion for this, yeah. So here's um, a horrible PowerPoint slide, <laughs> sorry. So I highlighted a few things in yellow. Uh, what's important is that, you know, a lot of news is bad news that you hear. Right? There's been a lot of issues with the production of programs in the last couple of years post pandemic. And when you're serving millions and millions of people, there's going to be some ones that went bad. Um, customer service was not the best. We are the first ones to say that. You should have heard a meeting I was on the other day. It was like, oh crap. This customer service program, I mean, everybody in the field, I'm in the field of operations. I mean, we were not easy on the customer service piece. 
lessons learned. But at the end of the day, when you look at the numbers, the SBA came in when no one else did. And that's what people have to remember. It's easy to yell at people when things are wrong, but it's hard to remember all the good that has come out of some of the programs. And those of you in banking, you know how hard you worked on these PPP loans. I'm looking at Jim, looking at Eva, I'm looking at Becky. I mean, you know how hard they worked. Brandon Eldridge, I see you too. So overall, more than 60,000 participants engaged in programs like Small Business Week, SBDC and BBB held the largest one in the nation last year, so we were part of that number. Yes, and we continue to be a part of that number. Um, over 66,000 virtual and in-person events. What was really cool is they expanded the reach of Women Business Resource Centers with 140 additional centers nationwide. That was a very, very big thing. Partnered with a lot of minority communities and colleges, um, which was really cool. Um, 44.8 billion in funding through core lending programs, that's the 7A and 504 programs. Talk to our bankers if you want more information about what those are. I'll just put it back on you guys. See, that's what people do, we delegate really well, yep. Uh, <laughs> and then non-COVID disaster relief, so 2.3 billion. So really the core programs and other programs continued on with the SBA. So as you know, the PPP loan debt relief, 30 months of deferment on 7A and 504 uh, loans were in effect due to the pandemic. Economic injury, disaster loans, um, the EIDLs, all of them, they have so many names. Uh, the Chartered Benny Operator Grant and Restaurant Revitalization Funds were the co-programs that were pandemic related through the Small Business Administration. So COVID disaster relief numbers in 2021 through the uh, SBA, nearly 800 billion uh, were loaned out under the PPP loans and 732 billion so far in total forgiveness paid as of May 29th. They're churning this out, you guys. As much as you hear again of some of the tough stuff out there, they are getting things done. And it surprises me every day on these calls and how hard people are working behind the scenes. They are no different than you and I going to work, making sure they're supporting the small business community. Uh, 28.58 billion in the RRF fund, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, 14.55 billion on the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, many of those here in our community, uh, and then 30, 378 billion in the EIDL programs and approximately 1.1 million awards, um, totaling 7.6 billion on the COVID EIDL targeted and supplemental advanced programs. That's a lot of money, you guys. That's a ton of money. So here in Colorado, uh, total COVID relief was $22 billion, a little bit over that. Not bad, guys. You guys worked your butts up, bankers and resource partners. Thank you for sending people to SBDCs, for example, to package you know, the, the financial requests that we had through these programs. But you can see the breakdown here on each one of those. I'm not going to go through this, but this is core program dates, horrible slide or numbers, um, but it does break down to El Paso and Teller County, which is really important because your Pikes Peak SBDC and BBB, we cover a certain region and we want to make sure it's well represented in these numbers as well. Okay, so where we are now, all of these programs are closed. That's all I need to say there. So all the amazing programs, they're closed. If you have questions about a loan that's processing or something like that, I'm going to defer you to the Colorado SBA because they are the ones that you will need to talk to. Um, but at that point, they're going to send you to the customer service line. That's a joke <laughs> because it sucks. So we're going to do everything we can to find exactly where your loan is in process. But by now or in the next week, you should get an email if you're in the processing stage of some of these EIDL loans. But basically, all of these are closed. There are no more pandemic-related programs. So with that said, what are we doing now at the SBA? Well, we're focusing on some core programming. Core programming, just like we all had to do during the pandemic and make sure everything that we do keeps moving forward, right? That's what small business does. Pan pandemic stuff is a Band-Aid. But how are we really going to get through and strategically support ourselves as small businesses and a community? So these are those types of programs that will do that. So really a big focus on equity and accessibility. There's been a big focus under the Biden-Harris administration under that, which completely agree with. Government contracting reforms, there's a little bit of that coming down too. Um, there's an ascent platform that was launched a little bit ago for women-owned small businesses, and there's been an expansion on that. If you're a women-owned small business, you should really check it out. Great training under that program. Uh, the Small Business Digital Alliance uh, is a new program launched to help get products into the global market. Uh, core capital programs. If you've used the lender match tool, sometimes it's a little bit hit or miss, so they're doing a little bit of revamp on that. 
uh, Emerging Leaders is a strategic planning program. How many of you heard of Leading Edge at Pikes Peak SBDC? Yeah, so quite a few of you, right? Some of you have even taught at it. Well, this is the next level. So if you're looking at a CEO level strategic planning program that really takes you to that further next step, we have approval to run one here in Colorado Springs. There were 30 three-ish applicants, and we're actually going to be interviewing those applicants and part of that team next week, and we'll be picking 20 to be a part of this amazing program uh, here in Colorado Springs. So excited we finally have one. Uh, community Navigators Engagements, it was another program, the SBA launch. It's a little bit in the launch phase still, but it's additional programs to help reach communities that have otherwise not been reached very well. So a big part of that is Native American communities in the Rocky Mountain region. Uh, and then, of course, the celebrations. How do we not love those, right? So National Small Business Week for Veterans is coming up in November. The Pikes Peak SBDC does a lot with that, so I'm excited. I'll probably be down for that one. And then uh, Small Business Saturday. As you know, we have a lot of fun with that in our community, so don't forget to shop small after Thanksgiving. All right, lots of resources and links. You can grab those off the website. Again, if you have any questions, I am available after this. I may not know the answer yet, in all honesty, but I will always find the answer for you and give you the honest information that you need um, to those as answers, okay? All right, so now, very quickly, I'm gonna be, do, like, I'm gonna be really passionate about this because it's been 10 years creating impact in our community through the Pikes Peak SBDC. <laughs> and all of the consultants out here, this is all you. You've made this happen, the partners, it takes a village. So this is our report to the community. It's a combination of all of 2021 and a portion of 2022 because we've got a quarter and it really doesn't tell the story. So I've combined those both. Um, so thanks to our sponsors as always, not only today and for Small Business Week, but um, all through the year, El Paso County Economic Development has been the host for SBDC and we are thankful for them, the city of Colorado Springs and to Park State Bank and Trust, Car Springs Utilities. Thank you, Sherry, I see you here. And uh, Vector Bank, so thank you all for sponsoring the SBDC so we can do what we do. Um, such a sad slide. <laughs> do you see what's happening here? So I actually had my face on it and I was gonna put a big X with like a big sound that, you know, there's just a big hollow hole. <laughs> Um, so TBD, executive director, um, so that's who's filling that role right now. Hopefully it will get posted soon. We have three quarters left of the year and there's a lot to do. Uh, but that executive director position, if you are interested, I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one with you to tell you what it's really like. The one thing you need to know is it is the best damn job in the world. I would not have left it unless I got recruited for this job. It is the best job in the world. Becky Hager, Grants and Contracts Coordinator, The Bomb, Lauren Shakes, Program Manager, Shala Denton, thank you every, for everything that you do. We always give credit where it's due. So thank you guys. So this is the slide I'm gonna focus on the most and then I'm literally gonna click through super fast. The SBDC is responsible and accountable for the impact it creates in communities. And it's just not a bunch of numbers that we say, this is what we did. And I guarantee you a lot of people do that. And I know they do, actually, because we have very strict rules on how we report impact. We are accredited, we are held to very high standards. All of these numbers are produced like this. When an SBDC client comes in, Shala says, how did we help you since your last visit? And if we don't do it that way, you get a survey. And you have to digitally sign off as a client that says, we, the SBDC did help me. And if we didn't help them, don't worry, clients tell us that too. Nope, you didn't help me with that one. Great. But we have to get a signature and then it's checked by a third party. So at any given moment, an SBDC can pull a number that is honest, true, authentic, and real. And double checked three times. So it's not fake, you guys. So this is real stuff. And I'm very passionate about that because people pull fake numbers all the time, don't they? Right? So this is real. So business starts 48. That sounds low when we have 30 people in a startup class every month. But these are people that are making transactions, that are paying employees. They're not just registered with the Secretary of State. They're actually doing things. And this number we can work on and actually probably have a ton more to add. But it's one of the hardest numbers to track because they get going, they leave, and then you see them two, leaves, two years later at times because they're so busy, right? But you can see here, we're very accountable as an SBDC for the impact we create. We talk about capital formation, sales increase, increase in contracts, number of events. Look at that, 196 events, you guys, that the SBDC has done with four people. I mean, that's amazing, right? That's a lot of events. Almost 3,000 attendees 
alone for the events that we had. And that doesn't even call small, count Small Business Week because these are numbers we put in our system and actually have addresses for everybody that attends. So you add you know, the 11,000 from last year, look at where that number takes you. So very countable, 16 million in capital formation and loans, sales increases, increased contracts. Look at the number of jobs we've created. 250, jobs retained 471 and a half. I'm not sure. I should have just rounded up <laughs> on that one. But I mean, these are real numbers and, we're, and the, the team should be very proud of that. I'm almost out of time, aren't I? I'm over by three minutes. Ah, dang it. See, I talk too much. These, little, these short time frames don't work for me. So there's a lot of numbers that you can pull from our website on COVID program activity. Obviously that's gone down because of loan and grant programs closing. Um, and you can see like our gender demographics, we serve more women than men, goes along with the national trends. Um, but really we can break down by segments, by startups. We actually serve a lot more existing than startups. Um, firms by age, you can see the most of ours are four to five years old. So we really service those that are strategically growing. And then we service all these different industries. People are like, who do you serve? We serve everybody. And that's what's important. It's accessible for all industries that are growing. There's a lot of programs, cybersecurity, startup to cyber, you know, right, Rodney? Uh, and then lots of free classes to reduce the barriers to, access, to access, accessing our programs and starting your business here in our community. So lots of success stories, check those out. Send questions to the SBDC, you're welcome team. <laughs> SBDC at ElPasoCO.com. Thank you guys so much. That was awesome. Thank you, Aikha. So it is nice to know that we have so much passion that is going from SBDC, staying local, but going regional. So Aikha, thank you again. Uh, I'm going to follow that by speaking very quickly because we have an awesome keynote speaker and I wanna make sure he has a full hour. You all know the Better Business Bureau. We've been around for over 100 years locally. We're at 42 years and uh, our job, literally our mission as a nonprofit is to advance marketplace trust. And so that's what we continue to do every day. Um, just since this is the state of small business, I wanted to give you some quick numbers, which is we serve 25 counties here in Southern Colorado. This last year we processed 2,500 complaints. Uh, we have um, 4,500-ish customer reviews. Those are verified by a human, not a Google review or something else. Number of business profiles, uh, 28,000 customer inquiries. This means folks actually being talked to with, by a human, 604,000 uh, customer inquiries. And then we do an investigations into uh, business practices in our communities every day. Um, some special recognition, thank you very much. Uh, some special recognition, uh, Jonathan couldn't be here today, but he leads our team and we are so appreciative of all he does. Um, the Gazette awarded us for the fifth consecutive year, one of the best places to work. And then we did receive from the SBDC and the SBA, the Amy McDowell Service Award, and we're super proud of that. That's uh, to basically any business in the state of Colorado. So we're super proud. Those are the last of my stats, a couple programs that we're rolling out that are very innovative and exciting. BBB for Good launched locally and internationally. So brainchild and a lot of support here from Ada Rodriguez and the operations team here. We're about a block down the street for launching BBB for Good, which is a listing of businesses that combine purpose and profit. I'm gonna go super quick. For the first year last year, um, the vast, majority of uh, consumers are purpose-driven. So instead of being value-driven, they're interested in where their products came from and what good they bring to society. So there is no list out there of where you could shop at a purpose-driven business uh, or BBB for, or a business for good. And so this will be the first li list created internationally. Last thing, uh, I won't cover this in too much. We've got a ton of great partners on the back of this, almost every chamber in town, um, et cetera. But as we're coming out of the pandemic, fingers crossed, uh, we have, uh, we, we've noticed there's a lot of mental health issues and it's, a, it's big on the, the minds and hearts of employees, employers. And so we have uh, created a mental health business partnership with just the collaboration of all our community partners to provide resources for businesses and their employees to uh, address mental health in the upcoming years. 
Um, with that, I would like to welcome Mr. Jerry O'Brien. Come up on stage, and if you would mind. Welcome. <laughs> My name is Jerry O'Brien. I'm uh, uh, very happy to be your uh, closing keynote speaker today. And so here's what we're getting a little. What's that? Oh, move the antenna. Oh, oh. put in front. Do the front antenna. Yeah, baby. Yeah, if you're, he said, if you're still hungry, there's food. We have twice as much food as we need. So if you're still hungry, go get food. So we're going to talk about influence today. And we all are in a position where we need to influence someone. The crux of what I talk about is how do you influence customers to buy from you? Some of you in the room today are saying, man, I got too many customers. I either have supply chain issues. I've got a challenge with that. I can't get enough employees. So another question is, how do you influence customers to buy from you? And how do you influence employees to work for you? Today, we have to influence employees the same way we influence customers. Remember when you were a kid and you would go to the dentist's office? Does anyone remember the name of the magazine at the dentist's office? Highlights Magazine. You go to the dentist's office and you, you get Highlights Magazine. I'm going to move this down just a bit. Highlights Magazine. And in Highlights Magazine, you open up Highlights Magazine. And in there, there's two pictures. And your job is to circle what can you find that's different from one picture to the next. Remember that? We're going to do a modern day version of that. I'm about to show you two videos. Now, the video, the first one's a little grainy. You'll probably be able to get the gist of it. I'm going to show you two videos, and I want you to pick out what can you see that's different from one video to the next. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. Tires are changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stops. Now, it's funny to watch, right? But what were the big differences? What were the big differences that you saw from one video to the next? Yeah, more math. So, so the big difference, right, was that they got a lot faster. The question is, how did they get so much faster? More manpower. How many people were in the pits in the first video? Four. How do we know there was four? Because they said there's four people allowed, including the driver who didn't even get out of the car. There's four people allowed. How many people were in the pits in the second video? 17, 18, 20, there was 23 people somewhere on the screen, 21 of them go in and touch the car. 
So four people were allowed, now there's some other number allowed. That means at some point, what happened? The rules. Yeah, the rules changed. Do the rules in your business ever change outside of your control? Right? The pandemic, right? It, things, do things change outside of your control that you have to react to in your business? Yes, the pandemic. What are other examples of things that change that you have to react to that you don't control? Leadership of who? You're, yeah, so you're going to the customers, you're selling to the presidents of the company, all of a sudden tomorrow there's a different president. And they're like, who are you? Like, oh man. Leadership changes, your customers change. What else? Oh, your competitors change. Your competitors want to do something different that you're not doing so they can steal your customers. So your competitors are always trying to outpace you. What else? Oh, what's that? Po oh, you said politics? Yeah, that's changing like every, by day, isn't it? Politics, crazy, right? And so what else changes outside of your control? Laws, regulations, uh, all sorts of things related to laws and how we do our business. Things like tariffs even change and all of a sudden it changes our supply chain issues. What else changes outside of your control? What, what's that? Cultural what? Cultural attitudes? Yeah, like what do you mean? Oh yeah, so he just showed you charts that showed people care where their food comes from, what their companies do, how they give to the community. Are they driven by a purpose bigger than profits? Uh, what else changes outside of your control? Cyber attacks. Cy cyber attacks, cyber security, things outside of you trying to attack you. You know, no one hardly ever says that, but it's becoming a bigger and bigger deal, isn't it? What else changes outside of your control? Cost of goods, oh my gosh, this inflation thing. We haven't experienced this since I was like a kid, right? All of a sudden, inflation is going like crazy. Gas prices are going nuts. All of these things have an impact. What else did you see that was different from one video to the next that got them to be so much faster? The technology. What kind of technology were they using in the first video to change tires? Hammer. Yeah, they're banging a hammer. Technology was a hammer. Strategy was hit hammer faster, right? <laughs> What kind of technology were they using in the second video to change tires? Pneumatic, air wrench, you could hear it, rawr, rawr, pneumatic wrench. Can you ever take the old way that we used to do things? We can, can we take a hammer and ever change a tire as fast as we can do it with a pneumatic wrench? You can't do it. We come to events like this, we collaborate with other entrepreneurs and business owners because we want to use the newest, latest, greatest. We want to become more efficient. We want to become more profitable. We want to attract more customers. We want to be better at attracting employees. So the new tools and the new technology. How, how many people were changing tires in the first video? One dude, how many tires did he change? Two tires, one dude changed two tires using a technology of a hammer. Okay, this is for all the marbles. How many people were changing tires in the second video? Eight, 12, the answer is 12. So, so we've got a Formula One person in here. 12, here's how you know. <clears throat> there's one person holding the new tire. There's one person running the pneumatic wrench. There's a third person pulling the old tire off. Three people per tire, they changed all four tires. They did a 12 person tire change. Do you suppose <clears throat> the first time they ever did a 12 person tire change, it looked like that? No, what was it like? <gasps> it was like the first day of the pandemic when the whole country, March 14th or whatever it was, the whole country shuts down, everyone says, I'm staying home. And you're like, wait a minute, how are we gonna manage this? So we get disrupted and sometimes things disrupt us and we're messy before we get better. Sometimes you come to an event like this, you talk to somebody and you're like, oh, what are you doing on, on, uh, are you, uh, on this, on that, on the insurance, on QuickBooks, on what? Oh, Oh, I'm doing, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. I got to go do that. You take it back to your team and you say, hey, we're going to change a bunch of things. And your team's like, woohoo. No, they're like, oh no, no, what? no, we're fine. It, it's vital. Oh, that, what's your name? Kim. Kim says, oh, hey, what? she goes back and says, oh, we're going to change these things. And they say, oh, that'll never work. <laughs> we get pushed back, right? Because sometimes we got to get messy to get better. Tiger Woods. 1996, Tiger Woods was 21 years old. It was the first year he ever played on the PGA tournament. That year he won, straight up won, 25% of all the PGA tournaments that he was in. Is that a good win rate? Yeah, all the golfers are like, ooh, yeah, that was really good. 21 years old, he winning like no one had ever won before. 
by age 23, two years later, he's only winning 5% of the tournaments because he changed something. Does anyone know what he changed? He changed his swing. He changes his swing. Now think about this. He's been golfing since he was three. He's been practicing his swing for 20 years, winning like no one had ever won before. And he says, I think if I change my swing, I can win even more. But it's going to require me to be messy while I'm going through the change. You collaborate. You get uh, uh, great coaching. You get all these resources from the Better Business Bureau and Chamber of Commerce and all these things. And you're going to change some things. And sometimes it's going to be messy. But you do it because by two years later, he's winning 45% of the tournaments that he enters. You get better. You get better. Then he plateaued like a lot of businesses do. He changed the swing again, and by 2008, he's winning 67% of the tournaments that he enters. This is how you become a very successful business, by using these resources, by collaborating with one another, by coming to events where you might learn something new that you put to, put to work in your business that allows you to do something new. Here's the truth. We're all in the business of influence. So. Uh, we're all in the business of influence. We all have to influence someone. You might say, well, I'm influencing customers to buy from me. I'm influencing employees to work for me. I'm influencing a bank to give me a loan. In 2002, I left my first job ever in marketing. I started out my marketing career at Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, Ohio, big Procter & Gamble. I moved to Colorado to work in marketing for Coors Brewing Company. A Couple of weeks after I get to Coors, there's a big marketing department offsite. We're all leaving the office building, going to a hotel like 10 minutes away to have an all day marketing meeting. I'm walking out of the office building and I end up walking out next to the chief marketing officer of Coors Brewing Company. Now this is my boss's, 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 boss. The head of the whole marketing department for $4 billion Coors Brewing Company. Walking out next to him, he turns to me, he says, oh, hey Jerry. Why don't you ride over there with me? And I'm thinking, yeah, good opportunity to get to know the chief marketing officer. We walk out to his car. It's this big, super sleek, long, brand new Mercedes Benz. And I'm thinking, ooh, successful. Then it occurs to me, I got 10 minutes with the chief marketing officer. I better ask him something really smart. So I look smart. So I'm ticking through all the questions in my mind. What should I ask? What should I ask? I sit down in the front seat of that car. He pulls out and I'm thinking, what's the most important marketing question of all? Finally, I turn to him and I say, Lee, why is it that a consumer, right? The people that give us the money. Why is it that a consumer chooses to buy one beer versus another beer? Now I'm thinking he's about to give me a 10 minute lesson on how people choose and how we as marketers influence them to choose us. Instead, he turns to me and he says, well, geez, Jerry, if I knew the answer to that question, we'd all be rich. <laughs> I'm thinking, you appear to be rich. And you're the head of marketing for a $4 billion beer company. And you don't know how do we influence people to buy this versus that? I spent the rest of my career creating and honing this framework of influence that you're going to see today about how do you influence people to buy from you, to work for you in a really crowded and competitive market. Because we know for sure if you can influence people to buy, you can grow your company. If you can't influence people to buy, you can go bankrupt. Here's two five-year stock charts of direct competitors. The one on the top goes bankrupt in 2012, a decade ago, put out of business by the one on the bottom. The one on the bottom, all of you probably used more of this company, dramatically more, during the pandemic. Any guesses as to what two companies those are? Yeah, oh, Sears, Amazon, I heard Blockbuster and Netflix. You guys got all of them, Blockbuster and Netflix. What was Netflix's business model back in 2008? Yeah, I remember they were mailing you those DVDs in the mail. Years later, I talked to the gentleman who was the director of research at Blockbuster in 2008. 2014, I've got his, his, his resume in front of me. I'm interviewing him for a job. I looked down his resume. I said, you're the director of research at Blockbuster in 2008. He said, yep. I said, your job was to give the executive team insights about the mindset of your customers so you could sell more and you could be more profitable. He said, yep, that was my job. Dude, <laughs> what happened? He said, I'll tell you what happened. I went to the board of directors in 2008 and I told them, 
Our consumers, the people that give us the money, they really like that DVD mailing thing to which the board of directors said some version of this. They said, that's great. What do you recommend we do with our 9,000 stores and our 100,000 people that work in the stores? It's like, I don't know, but people really like the DVD mailing thing a lot. I travel all over the country and all over the world delivering breakthrough marketing thinking for audiences like you. I'm about to reveal to you breakthrough marketing thinking that will forever change your life. Give your customers more of what they want and less of what they don't. <laughs> Solid, right? I know, right? Yep. It's good. Now, some of you are saying, Jerry, that seems really obvious. Yeah, but one of the funny things is we actually don't do a very good job at this. Give me examples of things you did not like, you don't have to yell them out, that you did not like about Blockbuster. What did you not like about Blockbuster? Late fees. I didn't like late fees. You know what they called them? Extended viewing fees. Have the, the viewing experience as long as you would like. No, late fees. We didn't like them. What else do you not like about Blockbuster? Rewind. Oh my God, they never, rewinding, you're my generation. Be kind, rewind. Like this says, they didn't have the movie I wanted. I get down to the aisle, all the new releases are all gone. So then what did you do, remember? You dug around under the window, remember where they shoved the movies through? Like, hey, is, did it come back in? Did it come back? You guys all did that. I did too. What else do you not like about Blockbuster? The hours of operation. What else do you not like about Blockbuster? You had to go there. You had to get in your car. You had to put your shoes on, you had to put your pants on, you had to get the car, you had to drive there, you had to go park in the parking lot, you got to walk in. They didn't have the movie you want in the first place, so you didn't get a movie, you got a movie you didn't even really want. If you get to bring it back, they give you a late fee. Netflix says, what if you never have to drive to the store again, we'll mail it right to you. What if we have an unlimited selection of every movie you want, we change the way we negotiated movie rights with the studios. What if you never have to go to the store again? What if no more late fees? Mail it back whenever you want to. More of what you want, less of what you don't. They took down a $6 billion, 9,000 location brand in about a decade flat, bankrupt. So more of what you want, less of what you don't drives everything. The insights about your customers drive everything that you do. Now, you guys said Amazon and Sears, you guessed all the right answers. No, Amazon and Sears doesn't go bankrupt until 2018. 2018, Sears goes bankrupt. Do you remember the strategy they used to try to not go bankrupt? They merged with Kmart. Yeah, it didn't work. So Sears goes bankrupt, arguably put out of business by Amazon. Now, sometimes with audiences like you, they say, Jerry, this marketing stuff is great, but we are in a relationship business. Our business is built on relationships. We don't have to do that mar marketing thing. Do any of you feel like you have a relationship with Amazon.com? Interesting. One, one day as an audience, got a bunch of people in the audience, woman in the front row was like, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. I'm like, yeah. She's like, I got a relationship with Amazon. It's not a healthy one. <laughs> I've got a relationship with Amazon. Yeah, here's my relationship with Amazon. I live in Greenwood Village, Colorado, right up the road here. And I've got a little hobby farm, but I don't have horses. I've got four Nigerian dwarf goats. And they think it's really funny to escape. Mm -hmm. You know what they do when they escape? Nothing. Stand around, eat my trees, mm -hmm. really funny. Eat all my grasses, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm always trying to keep them in. So I run down to Home Depot to get welded wire fencing, to staple more fencing and to keep the goats in. Standing in the aisle of Home Depot, looking at welded wire fencing is not quite the gauge I want. So I get on my Amazon.com app, standing in the aisle of Home Depot. I find four foot high welded wire fencing. It's the exact gauge I want. It says it'll be on your front doorstep in two days. There's 308 reviews, 4.8 stars, I click. Yes. My relationship with Amazon is that they make it exceedingly easy for me to do business with them. Click here, boom, boom, boom. My relationship with Amazon is they communicate with me effectively all the way through. My, how do you communicate effectively with your customers all the way through their customer journey? From the time I click yes to the time it's loaded on the truck to the time they say it's nine stops away to the time they take a picture of it on my doorstep to the time Alexa goes, Woo, your package has arrived. This is the important one. My relationship with Amazon is that they give me certainty I'm making a good call. Your customers, your clients are afraid of making a bad decision. And it's your job to give them the certainty that you are not only a good decision, you are the best decision of all 
your competitors, and all the other things they could do with that money. How does Amazon make me so certain I'm making a good call? 308 reviews, 4.8 stars. Look at all, the, you, all of you already bought the welded wire fencing, and you said, this is great, this is great, now I have confidence. We call that social proof in that way. There's 20 different ways you can create proof that you are a safe choice. Your customers don't wanna make a bad call. Your customers don't just want a better relationship today, they want a more valuable relationship. Amazon has added value to every component of how they do business with us. We've, most of us have never talked to anyone except the person who drives the vehicle that drops the thing off at our house. And yet they have built a relationship with us based on convenience, based on certainty, based on communication. We need to make sure we're building those things into our relationships. Here's the problem, nobody buys anything. We use that language, like I'm gonna to go to the mall, I'm gonna buy a shirt, I'm gonna to go to the car dealer, I'm gonna buy a car. You go to the mall and there's tons of shirts and we, the activity is not buying, the activity is this, choosing between options. And this is what your clients and your customers do day in and day out. Do they choose to buy from you, buy from someone else, not spend the money altogether. So how do we get customers to choose us? out of all those options. A few years ago, I'm at home, I'm making ribs for dinner. I realize I'm out of barbecue sauce, so I run down to the grocery store to buy barbecue sauce. How many kinds of barbecue sauce are at the grocery store? 42 kinds of barbecue sauce at my grocery store. So I went there to buy, but I'm faced with choosing between all the options. To your clients and your customers who don't work with you yet, you look like barbecue sauce. And they're trying to figure out which is the right barbecue sauce for me. And if your label on your barbecue sauce, if your website, if your videos, if your brochures, if your proposals, if your one-on-one -on -one conversations look the same as all the other barbecue sauce, you haven't helped me choose you. You've just made me more confused. And remember, I don't want to be confused. I want confidence. I'm making a good decision. So... What our goal is, is to make your label on your barbecue sauce look unique from all the other barbecue sauce. We must answer one specific question. I can make this slide go forward. There we go. You should buy from us versus all the other options out there because I want you to do this. Think about your company. Think about your customers. If your challenge, by the way, right now is that not that you can't get enough customers, it's that you can't hire enough employees. You should work for us because, and I want you to finish this sentence. You should buy from us versus all of our other competitors because, and I want you to fill in the most compelling thing you can think of. The most compelling thing. If you were trying to convince someone, what would you say? Now, I want you to think, could any of your competitors have just said the same thing? If yes, you haven't helped me choose you, you've just made me more confused. So I'm gonna show you in the rest of the presentation how to create something so compelling that you can sell things, even commoditize things, even in crowded markets, you can convince me to buy versus all the other options out there. In order to influence people to choose you, we must understand how people choose. People choose in their brains. And in, because it's in their brains, it's partly rational and partly emotional. That's just the way our brains work. Left brain, right brain. For hundreds of years, economists have been trying to convince us that all decisions are rational, logical decisions. Remember Econ 101, prices go up, demand goes down. Prices go down, demand goes up. We're all rational, logical thinkers, according to economists. Is that true? No, we're all very emotional. We're very emotional. So for 120 years, marketers have been saying, no, we have to sell on emotion. We have to sell them on the... What Look, look like or feel like. You ever seen a Super Bowl commercial? It made you laugh or it made you cry. It made you emotional. And later you're talking to somebody about it. Oh my gosh, did you see that one commercial? It had the dog and it had the donkey and it had the thing. And they did the, oh my gosh, that was so funny. That was so funny. What was that for? Yeah, I, I don't remember, but it was so funny. Yeah, emotion for the sake of emotion also doesn't sell anything. So what does? The 2002 Nobel Prize winner in economics was not an economist. He was a psychologist, 
that unraveled how our brains actually connect to make these decisions of how we say yes. Here's what he was able to show. That in fact, we do make emotional decisions. We know we do. But our brain, our subconscious, our gut is looking for rational, logical proof that we're making a good call. I like to put it this way. Your brain needs a rational reason to make the emotional decision. In fact, you want a rational reason such that you could convince someone else. How often are you selling to someone and they leave and they have to go convince someone else on your behalf and you're not even in the room? How, they, you, they want rational, logical proof that you're the best decision such that they could convince their CEO, their spouse, their father-in-law, their neighbor. So have we given them reasons why we're a better option in so much confidence that they can then repeat it to someone else? Rational reason to make the emotional decision. There are four questions that make up the framework of influence. Now these four questions and the case studies have nothing to do with your business. They have everything to do with you learning the framework so you can apply it to your business. Now, I have tiny little business case studies in here, and I have billion-dollar brand case studies. It doesn't matter if you're a small company, big company. It doesn't matter if you're professional services, if you're a restaurant, if you're a manufacturer, if you're anything in between. It doesn't matter. You can use this to influence customers, influence employees, influence people to say yes to you. Question number one, who are you? Who are your ideal customers? Who are you really trying to influence? Here's a case study of a little auto repair shop. It's called Sixth Avenue Auto. This gentleman leased a two bay, he was a certified auto mechanic. He leased a two bay auto repair shop because he always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So he opens his first auto repair shop on Sixth Avenue and he specialized in only two kinds of cars, imports and domestics. Yeah, I think that's pretty much all of them. That pretty much covers it. Because he's like, I'm an auto mechanic. I can fix any kind of car. He thought that everyone within three miles around would come in and get their car fixed at his shop just because he opened, because he existed. He didn't have enough customers. So he started marketing. He put out door hangers all within three miles around. He said, come into Sixth Avenue Auto and get a $20 oil change. People flooded in for a $20 oil change. And then whew, nobody came back. Darn it. Marketing. He said, but Jerry, do you know what I realized? When people were coming in for that $20 oil change, I said, what did you realize? Getting insights in the mindset of his customers. I said, what did you realize? He said, seems like a lot of people in this neighborhood drive Audis and Volkswagens. Oh, okay, what, what'd you do? He goes, well, I changed my website to say, we specialize in Audi and Volkswagen. Your Audi and Volkswagen headquarters. I'm like, man, that sign out front is not a picture of an Audi or a Volkswagen. He's like, I know, that sign was $2,000. And I couldn't afford to change out the sign, so I just changed the website because it was free. I said, oh, what happened? He said, well, people didn't come in from within three miles around. People started coming in from all over the whole city. He said, you know why? Now he's got the insight. I said, why? He goes, turns out there's a lot of people out there that don't want to pay to go to the dealership, but they do want to go to someone who specializes in their kind of car. Over and over, as people narrow their focus, their business grows faster. He tripled his business in 18 months by narrowing his focus. Now, that's not to say you can't serve a few different customer types. You can. The question is, what do you say? What do you do for those customer types that makes them feel like you are the perfect solution for them? Specificity drives sales. Specificity also drives efficiency in your business. It drives efficiency in your marketing strategies and your marketing plan. It drives specificity in your message and what you're gonna say, and it speeds up trust. If you have a Volkswagen and I specialize in only Volkswagens, no problem, fix it. Get it, you got it, you do this all day long. If, if you're going into the other general auto repair shop and you say, can you fix this? You're like, oh yeah, it's a car. I got it. No problem. You ever fixed a Volkswagen? Nah. Just like every other car. What do you mean? Uh, how much is the specialist? More. You going to pay him? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> the other guy's going to jack up some. It's not going to work right. Specificity works wonders for your business. Question number two, what are your insights? Those ideal customers, 
What do you know about them? Remember, what do they want more of? What do they want less of? Remember from Netflix and Blockbuster? Said even more powerfully, what do they hope for? And what do they fear? What do they hope will happen if they give you the money? What do they fear will happen if they give you their money? Even more powerfully, what do they fear will happen if they don't give you their money and they give it to someone else? Pay attention to the bottom part of the matrix. Brain science shows us that we are about twice as motivated to avoid what we don't want as we are to get what we do. What is it your customers are trying to avoid? They don't want to make a mistake by having given you the contract or given you their money. That's for sure. What's the real problem they're trying to solve? What are they actually trying to solve? Many times the product or the thing that you sell is not the same as the problem they're really trying to solve. What do they really want you to deliver for them? Employee insights. Think about the same thing. If you're trying to hire employees right now and you're having a hard time, what do employees care about? Now, it's easy for us to say, oh, well, those millennials, oh, those millennials, oh, we have high turnover, or they can't keep, or the Gen Z or whatever. One day I'm with a, a big franchise organization. It's the night before the event. No one knows who I am because I haven't spoken yet. So I'm hanging out, I'm talking to this gentleman who owns a three and a half million dollar Wings franchise. I'm talking to him, he goes, what do you, where, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm your keynote speaker tomorrow. I'm from Denver. He goes, oh, keynote speaker, what you talking about? I'm like, Thanks for reading the agenda. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> I'm speaking about the millennials and, and working with millennials. And he said, oh, those millennials. Oh, man, those millennials. I'm like, who's this standing right next to you? He goes, this is Chad. I'm like, who's Chad? He, he, said, I said, he said, Chad's the general manager of my Wings restaurant. So how old is Chad? He said, 24. I'm like, Chad's a millennial. No, this is years ago. And the guy goes, oh, well, he's not one of those millennials. Okay, well then the challenge is, let's hire the good ones, right? So the employee insights, what do they want from you? The next generation, one of the big things that we're seeing now, it's no surprise to you, they want more flexibility. They've always wanted more flexibility because they need flexibility. And then COVID happened. And then they got a taste of flexibility. And they said, I can still do my job. 28% of every job posting right now is a virtual job. You're up against that. You might say, well, they gotta show up if we want them to do the electrical. They gotta go to the thing and do the thing, right? Yeah, but how do we build in based on the insights of what they want? Step one, ask them. Learn, listen, what do you want? What can we provide you? The tables have turned. If you wanna to hire today, you have gotta to market to your employees the same way you market to your customers. Insights about the mindset power your business. More of, less of, hopes for, fears. Question number three, what's your outcome? What do you promise to deliver? What do you promise that you will deliver to your customers? The age-old marketing question is this, who wants to buy a drill bit? The answer is nobody wants to buy a drill bit. What do they want to buy? A hole. Nobody wants to buy a drill, excuse me, a drill bit, they want to buy a hole. This uh, saying was popularized by a Harvard professor in the 1940s named Theodore Levitt. So nobody wants to buy the drill bit, they want to buy the hole. I showed this to a friend of mine and she goes, uh, Jerry, I don't get it. I'm like, it's not about the tool, it's about what the tool does for you. She's like, I don't want to buy a drill bit or a hole. She's like, I want to buy like my shelf on the wall with all my books on it. I want to buy what my life is going to look like after. There we go. After, I want to buy what my life is going to look like after I give you the contract, after I give you the money. What's the outcome that you promise to deliver to me? Now, I'm about to show you another video. This is a movie trailer, and I want you to pay close attention to something in this movie trailer uh, th that you don't normally see in a movie trailer. High def camera on. My girlfriend Katie, she thinks there's something in the house. I don't know. You believe me, right? I think we're gonna have a very interesting time capturing whatever paranormal phenomena is occurring or is not occurring. Windows are locked, doors are locked, the alarm is on. I'm hearing a weird sound. Something's here. I feel it breathing on me. 
footsteps in, but there's no footsteps out. What's the outcome of going to a scary movie? Being scared, that's it. It's not a trick question. Pay 15 bucks, get scared. That's the whole transaction. Simple, very simple transaction. Pay money, get scared. What did they show you in that movie trailer that you don't normally see in a movie trailer? The audience being scared. You see what they did? They gave your brain a rational reason to believe that you are going to be scared too. Look, these people are scared. Clearly, you'll be scared too. That, bud, that film had no budget. It was a tiny little, little no-budget film. It became a huge blockbuster hit. Now there are six other paranormal activity movies because they did one smart strategy. They turned around the camera. They gave your brain a rational reason to believe that this movie would be scary. Because look at those people. We call that social proof. There's social proof. It's the same as leaving an online review at Amazon. Look, these people are scared too. You've got great testimonials. You've got impressive clients. You've got things that prove that you are a good choice, that convince me that you are a safe choice. Your outcome is about them. It's about what you do for your customers. Then and only then do you get to talk about yourself. Now, you probably have all heard of find your why. People want to know why you do what you do. And this uh, is evident in why we do it. We want the world to be a better place. We want to provide something better. You just saw the charts, the statistics that show people care about what are you doing that's better for the world. Why do you want to do what you do? Now, if you're selling something that is, let's say, non-sexy, I work with people that sell tires, electrical repairs, things like that. Your customers are very excited about why you do what you do, right up until you give them the quote. You want them to give you a check. You got to hand over a bunch of money. Then they want to know, what do you do for me? And how do you do it differently or better than everyone else. Your why is inspirational. It's important for you, for your employees, for your customers. But when it comes to giving you the money, they want to know what's your because. What's the proof that you can deliver? Your why is inspirational. Your because is the proof that you're the best choice versus all the other choices. In the early 1980s, there was a woman named Ellen Langer. Ellen was the first ever female tenured professor at Harvard. She's a sociologist, and she studied how people were influenced to say yes by doing a famous study. Her original landmark study, there was a Xerox machine in the library at the university. There was always a lineup of people waiting to use this Xerox machine. So she would have a student walk up and try to cut in front of the line by saying different things to see which things were the most influential. First, she had the student walk up and say this, excuse me, I have five pages, small ask. I have five pages, may I use the Xerox machine? Straight ask. 60% of the time, they're like, oh, five, small ask, sure, go ahead. She said, I wonder if you give them a reason if we'll get a higher yes rate. She said, walk up and say this, still five pages. Hey, I got five pages, may I use the Xerox machine because I'm in a rush. Oh my gosh, you're in a, I'm happy to help. 94% of the time they said, sure. More influential when you have a reason. And she said, I wonder if your reason even matters. She said, walk up and try this. Hey, I got five pages. May I use the Xerox machine because I need to make copies. 93% <laughs> of the time they let them cut in line. Now, why does that happen? What she was able to show is that with a small ask, any reason will do. Throw in a because. Oh, because because our brain is looking to help out. We're bombarded with things. Sure, sure, small ask, go ahead. This study opens the New York Times, best-selling book on influence, millions of copies sold. It's called Influence by Professor Caldini. Opens with this study. This study is quoted hundreds of times on the internet about influence. What none of them tell you? Because you should be looking at this going, I don't think so. I don't think you can just like trick people into buying stuff, like big contracts, like big expensive. I don't think you can just trick them. That doesn't seem right. Is this like a trick? 
That doesn't seem right. And you would be right. What Caldini doesn't say in his book and what no one else says is there was a second part to the study. In the second part to the study, they went up and made a big ask. And that's what all of you do every day. You make big asks of people. You ask them to give you significant money, to give you significant trust. Many times people you don't even know or referrals from other people you do know and you're making a big ask. What they found in the second part of the study is that when you go up and what they did, they rolled up to the copy machine with 20 pages. And they're like, hey, I just got 20 pages. Can I cut in line? They're like, no. Unless you have a really good because. You're because when you're making a big ask, your because makes all the difference. Your proof that you're a better option than everyone else makes all the difference. Let me show you how this works in real life. Papa John's Pizza, what's their slogan? Yep, better ingredients, better pizza. Now, let's look at the framework. Question number one, who are your ideal customers? Question number two, what do you know about their insights, their mindset? Question number three, what outcome are you gonna promise? They've got better pizza is their promise. We're gonna make better pizza. Now, I want you guys to listen to this. I'm Jerry, I'm gonna open up a pizza company, all right? Here's my marketing, you guys ready for this? Here's my ad. Hey, everybody, come on into Jerry's Pizza. Our pizza's better. It sounds like marketing fluff. It might even be true that my pizza's better. But if I give you the outcome, if I give you the promise, and I don't give you any proof, do you see that your brain doesn't believe it? Your brain wants us to finish the sentence of influence. Oh, your pizza's better because? Oh, our pizza's better because we've got better ingredients. Now notice they didn't use the word because. There's no magic in the word because. The because is your proof. We got better pizza because we got better ingredients. They got sued by Pizza Hut when they were a tiny little startup. Pizza Hut sues them in federal court. Papa John's eventually wins the lawsuit because they use fresh sliced tomatoes and filtered water. And Pizza Hut did not. But now they've got a because. Because the federal government's court system said that we have better pizza than Pizza Hut. See, now they've got a piece of proof. Outcome plus because, I want you to always view how you are being influenced differently after today. Someone's going to make you a promise that they give you a because. Oh, it's going to be higher. This is a great one. Oh, it's going to be higher quality. Because? If you don't finish the sentence, we don't believe you and we don't buy from you. Let me show you another example. This is something I launched into the market when I was the brand manager of Coors Light. This is called the Coors Light Frost Brew Liner Can. Now, you're probably familiar with the one with the mountains that turn blue when it's cold enough to drink. This one comes before that. This is a different can. Look at this is a can that's got a blue liner inside the can. You see that blue liner in there? What do you suppose that can does? That keeps, keeps it colder or nothing? <laughs> nothing. Keeps it colder. Well, okay, keeps it colder. Well, actually what it does, let me show you. It locks in refreshing frost brewed taste. Yeah. Yeah, it's, mag oh, it's magic. I never said it's magic. Legal wouldn't say it. Let me say that. No. Um, so here's the secret of the frost brew liner can. Every aluminum can ever made has had a liner inside of it. Because you can't put beer next to aluminum or it will corrode. So we spray a clear liner inside the can to protect the aluminum from the beer. We turned our liner blue and told you it existed. And we gave it a fancy name. We called it the Coors Light Frost Brew Liner Can, but here's what happened. In a flat light beer industry, nobody could gain any share. We turned the liner blue and Coors Light can sales went up by 5%. $100 million incremental growth to the Coors Light brand because we turned the liner blue. Now, what I'm not saying is you should be misleading to your customers. What I am saying is over and over and over when I work with companies, you have becauses, you have a blue liner, you have things that you're doing differently than everyone else. You have things that your competitors don't do or can't do or won't do that you are willing to do to get the business, that you do differently. It's different that you do it and it's valuable to them. So. We made an incremental $100 million by pointing out something that was already there and most of you are already doing things and sometimes they are your best kept secret. 
Your because makes what you say more believable. I believe you. If you finish that, we have higher quality, that's because. My favorite one is, you can trust us. That makes me not trust you, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Thousands of customers have trusted us, that's because. We're the largest in the whole city, that's because. What is your piece of proof? By the way, you're the largest is a because. Thousands of people trust us. You can trust that we're going to do it right because we do more of these installs, more of these repairs than anyone in the entire city or the whole state. What's your because? What's the end of your sentence of influence? And it makes it more repeatable. Now I know what to say on your behalf. What's your proof? Oh, we got to go with this one versus that one because... Someone's going to tell their spouse, they're going to tell their father-in-law, they're going to tell their CEO, I know that this one is more expensive, but we got to go with it. That's because. What's your proof? I'm going to, your because is about you. Your outcome is what you do for them. Your because is about how you do it differently or better than everyone else. I'm going to wrap this up with a quick fun case study about how we use this exact framework on the Coors Light business to generate an incremental $250 million a year on the Coors Light business. I'm going to show you some TV commercials. Some of you are going to say, well, Jerry, why are you showing us TV commercials? We don't make TV commercials for our business. Maybe it doesn't matter if you should be making TV commercials. Maybe the question is, should you be using video somewhere in your sales process, somewhere in your presence, somewhere on your website or your social media? Should you be using video? The question is, if you should be using video, what should you say in your video if I gave you 30 seconds or one minute to say whatever you could say about your company? What should you say in that video that convinces me to buy from you versus everyone else? That's the framework that you're learning. I've spent my career making TV commercials for Procter & Gamble, Coors Light, Red Robin, that have sold billions of dollars of soap and beer and burgers. The technique that we use in the TV commercials that gets you to want to buy, it's your because. Watch big brand TV commercials. You'll always see a piece of proof. You'll always see a because. Anything from Procter & Gamble, it's always got a because. What's the proof? Here's the problem. Oh, oh yeah, before we get to that, oh, I put in something before I get to the story. I just set you up for the whole story. But I wanted to mention as I was prepping for this, and we were all talking about it, the resources that you have here to do things like find your because, collaborate with other people, get coaching, get trust, Better Business Bureau, no better way in the world to increase trust. You want to increase trust, you, you, you want to say you can trust us, oh, that's because we're the Better Business Bureau, we got thousands of great, amazing reviews, we got What's your because? What's, why would I trust you? You got the SBDC. Free coaching from super smart executive business people. Who wouldn't do this? Coaching, and, and you know what? People say, oh, I don't need the coaching. The smartest, best, most successful business owners that I know all get coaching. Top, top executives, they're all getting coaching because they're trying to get to the next level. You know which companies hire me to come in and do this framework? The companies that need it the least. You know why? Because they're always looking for the next little edge. Next little edge. You know who needs me? They don't do it because they're trying to save their way to prosperity. This is free. Free coaching from super smart people. This one is, I think, is, is the Pikes Peak Workforce Center. Super smart strategies in a really hard hiring environment, employment ready people. I would encourage you to do this. Think differently about your workforce. Think differently about who can do the skill set for the thing that you need. Do you know who they hire to do the tire change on Formula One cars? Athletes, you say athletes? They're all uh, former uh, NFL, either college or NFL uh, football players. Because, and, you, and someone said one time, oh, probably mechanics. How much mechanical skill do you need to do this? But you do need teamwork, you need speed, you need strength, you need agility, you need all the things that you get being a football player or being another, you know, big athlete, right? Think differently about your workforce. Who could you get that you wouldn't have normally thought about? How do you create diversity in your workforce? Not just racial diversity? How do you create diversity in ages? How do you create diversity in backgrounds? How do you create diversity in 
what people want from, from work, the Workforce Center can give you all sorts of people you may never have ever even thought about before. I get really excited about this because I know a lot of you are struggling to hire. The cha cha I, I just put in one Chamber of Commerce up here, but there's dozens of them all across in all the communities that you live in. Here's the thing I love about the Chamber of Commerce. You actually get to talk to each other. You collaborate. You learn from each other. It's a community. So be part of your Chamber of Commerce. And Exponential Impact, they told me about this too. This is really cool. It's for tech startups. And so that might apply to some of you or not all of you. But the resources that are here, use them. Most of these things are straight up free. <laughs> like, it's good. It's good stuff. So wrap-up story about your because. Here's the problem. Some of you guys, uh, ladies, may operate in industries where you're kind of the same as your competitors. It's a struggle to stand out. How do I stand out and do something different? Well, all light beer is basically the same. Now guys will be like, no, no, I'm a Bud Light guy. I'm a Coors Light guy. And then you give them a blind taste test, and we used to do this all the time. They can't pick their beer out of the lineup because it all tastes kind of the same. Now, who's the ideal customer for light beer? Middle-aged guys, people say two things a lot. They say middle-aged guys, and they say ladies. Okay, who drinks a lot of beer? Yeah, young men, right? So here's, here's the stats for you, so you can like narrow your focus. Question number one, who's the ideal customer for light beer? Men in the United States drink 75% of all the volume of the beer. So women, good target, but not as big. 21 to 24-year-old men drink eight times more light beer than other men. They're very high volume users. So your ideal customer, 21 to 24 year old men. I'm about to show you an ad that was running on the Coors Light business before, before I worked on the brand. What do you think? Did that ad sell beer? Sold something, right? Yeah. Um, here's the thing. Well, let me ask you a better question. Could you insert any other beer in that ad and run the same ad? Yes. And if your advertisements, if your websites, if your brochures, if your proposals, if your one-on-one -on -one conversations make you look like every other barbecue sauce, you haven't helped me choose you. You've just made me more confused. And remember, I want certainty. I'm making a good call. Certainty that I could use to convince someone else when you're not even in the room. So that ad did not accomplish that. We ran ads like that. That ad cost a half a million dollars to make the ad. We spent a hundred million dollars on TV commercials on TV that year and sales were flat. Do you know what your marketing folks are going to say if you spend a lot of money on marketing and sales are flat? They're going to say, just imagine what would have happened if we didn't spend all that money yeah, they're, they're going to try to justify their job, right? No. Job of marketing and sales is to make sales go up. So we looked at our insights. Question number one, who is your ideal customers? Question number two, what are their insights? Young guys told us they want good taste, value, because they're young, relaxation from their beer, low carbs and low calories, socialization, looking good at the party, refreshment, cold beer. Thanks, guys. Really helpful. And funny ads. So we looked at our competitors. We said, what are they already doing? And Miller Lite has always been talking about great taste and less filling. Still today, talking about low carbs and low calories. Bud Light is talking about socialization and they have the funny ads with the dogs, Buds McKenzie, the frogs, ribbit, ribbit, the dilly dilly, the whole funny ads. What about uh, relaxation? Is any beer known for relaxation? Corona, you don't want to compete with Corona on relaxation, so you're left with value, refreshment, and cold beer. We had a year-long debate on the Coors Light brand team about whether we could convince anyone that our beer was colder. Colder than what? Colder than the other beer in the same refrigerator? Like, no one is going to believe this. But look at what we had. We knew the ideal customers, these young guys, we knew the insights, the outcome they wanted was cold beer. 
Do you see what we're missing? What's your because? How are you going to finish the sentence of influence? Our beer is colder and more refreshing. That's because. You probably have becauses, pieces of proof in your business. If you don't, you might have to innovate. We had to innovate on Coors Light. First, we came out with the Frost Brew Liner can, blue liner in the can. Then we came out with the cooler box. It's an 18-pack of plastic bottles with essentially a blue garbage bag in it. See it? So you can put ice in the box. Yeah, they're 21 years old. I mean, work with me here. Ice <laughs> in the box, right? Super cold draft. It does not free Coors Light does not freeze at 32 degrees. It freezes at 27.4 because it's got alcohol in it. We created the draft system that would pour Coors Light at 29 degrees, poured below freezing. Then we came out with the one you're familiar with, the cold activated bottle. The mountains turn blue when it's cold enough to drink. Then we came out with a can where the mountains turn blue when it's cold enough to drink. Notice what we did. We took a commoditized product and we gave it a because it's got a blue liner, because you can put ice in the box, because it's poured below freezing, because it tells you when it's cold enough to drink. We didn't change the beer, we changed the amount of information you have about your beer. How important is it to know if your beer is cold enough to drink right before you take the first? Critical, critical, okay, it might not be that important, but it worked. So, so now watch this advertisement. Is it really necessary to brew Coors Light down as low as 34 degrees? Does it really matter if every beer is filtered cold? aged cold and packaged cold? Do the mountains really need to turn blue when your beer's as cold as the Rockies? Is Rocky Mountain cold refreshment really that important? You be the judge. Frost Brewed Coors Light, the world's most refreshing beer. Now you can't put any other beer in that ad because only Coors Light is brewed as low as 34 degrees, only Coors Light is filtered cold, aged cold, packaged cold. Only Coors Light tells you when your bottle is cold enough to drink. There was five becauses in that ad. Let me ask you this. What are you the only? We're the only that does what? Now, that's an advanced level strategy. It's hard to be an only. But if you can, it elevates everything you say next. We're the only electrical company. We're the only realtor. We're the only bank that... What is the only? If it's unique to you and valuable to them, then you're onto something. What are you willing to do that your competitors either can't do, they won't do, or they simply haven't done? What are you willing to do to go that extra mile to win over new customers? They don't, they buy your because. If you give me the outcome, if you make a promise and you don't finish the sentence of influence, I don't buy from you, I don't trust you. I go to someone where they prove to me that they can deliver what they say they're gonna deliver. If you want a copy, I should have told you this, you're gonna get a copy of the PDF of the presentation. If you want a PDF copy of this presentation, super slick. All you have to do is send a text message to the phone number 33777, and you text the word because, and it's gonna text you back and say, hey, it's Jerry. It's not, it's actually just a system. Um, <laughs> no, you text the word because, and what it's gonna do is gonna text you back it's gonna ask for your email address and it will email you not only a copy of the presentation, it will also email you a worksheet that you can do, use to do this in your business. And on the worksheet is 20 different ways you can create a because. Um, and you'll also be, you will be on my email list, but I never really send emails, except this fall, my book, They Buy Your Because book should be coming out. So you'll get a notification when that comes out if you wanna buy it. Uh, my direct email, if you want to get a hold of me, is Jerry with a G at whatbigbrandsknow.com. This is the correct spelling of my name, Jerry with a G, O'Brien with an O-N, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. Thank you. And, and oh, by the way, if any of you want to talk to me, if you want to follow up with me in person, I'm not going to spam you back if you put your email on my list. If you need me to follow up with you directly, please give me your business card so I can stay organized on who I'm going to follow up with. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for spending part of your day with me, and uh, I appreciate you guys being great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jerry. Was that amazing or what? <laughs> so what we didn't do was a proper introduction for Jerry. Sorry, Jerry. But I wanted to mention that Jerry was at our 
first Small Business Week as our keynote speaker 10 years ago at UCCS Burger Hall. Not sure some of you remember that, but I know Jim shaking his head yes. That Coors Light stuff is hilarious, isn't it? The bag in the, in the box, I mean, I love it. Jerry, thank you for coming back, supporting us in Colorado Springs. I know you speak to thousands and thousands of people. You impacted so many lives today with that presentation, thank you. We appreciate you so much. I wanted to give another shout out to U.S. Bank for being around for 19 years is I guess what we think it is for supporting small business. So thank you, U.S. Bank. The other shout out that I'd like to give is to the City Auditorium. Uh, for those of you who haven't had the time, check out what's going to be happening to this space. Part of the reason we wanted to have Small Business Week here is this is being re-envisioned into something really incredible. They're popping the ceiling. They're going out back. And uh, the Cultural Collective, watch what's going to happen to this historic building. I think it's going to be amazing. So uh, thank you for having us this week. And thank you to Eva and Becky both being here on behalf of Colorado Enterprise Fund. Thank you so much for your support for, for today's State of Small Business. And to Chaffa for supporting our keynote speaker, Jerry O'Brien. Thank you so much. Again, these slides will be on the website along with the video of this presentation if you'd like to share it with your teams. I'm going to throw this out as we wrap things up. It looks like we still have some food. If you want to take some on the way and take them to <laughs> colleagues, do it so we don't have to throw it away. Yeah. Um, thank you all for being here on behalf of the Better Business Bureau, bbb.org. Uh, check that out. And SBDC is pikespeaksbdc.org. The videos will be there. And we thank you and we hope you have a great week. Thank you.